Hello, this is Matt on the Moon Lambeau channel. My friends, SEC Chair Gary Gensler must severely regret saying this stuff. He, he really must. I've got further Gary Gensler confessions to share with you in this latest Moon Lambeau hot jam, including his analysis that uh, XRP has been usable since 2013 and would exist without Ripple. <gasps> well, how about that? So how is it that there's a common enterprise of XRP uh, could exist without Ripple? And and th so these uh, <laughs> these opinions come from what looks to be uh, a Microsoft PowerPoint presentation from June of 2018, back when Gary Gensler was teaching at MIT. And so he shared some of his personal opinions on this stuff and I got to tell you, some of this stuff is not something that would help the SEC's case versus Ripple. Because, as we all know, there hasn't been sufficient legal clarity for Ripple, uh, well, ever. There, there hasn't. Not, or anybody in the blockchain space. We know this to be true. The SEC's pretending it's not true. Uh, in 2018, Gary Gensler knew that wasn't true and articulated that verbally, actually. I mentioned that in a video just the other day. And now we've got this, which is at least as damning, if not more so. And you know that Ripple's attorneys, if this really does make it to court and there's not a settlement, you know that Ripple's attorneys are going to be highlighting all of this. This is coming from somebody uh, who is now the SEC chair running the entire SEC, and he wasn't sure about the status of XRP and Ether and other cryptocurrencies just three years ago. But Ripple was supposed to be? Oh, no, no, no. Which is why I've said so many times I would not want to be in the position of these SEC attorneys. I would much rather be uh, an attorney for, for Ripple if I had to be on, on one side. But um, before going further, I do want to be clear, I do not have a legal or financial background of any kind. I am not offering legal or financial advice, and you definitely should not buy or sell anything because of anything that I say or write. I'm just an enthusiast who enjoys making YouTubes all up in the internet about crypto-related topics, but just as a hobby, just for fun. That's all that's going on here. And so they titled this, uh, this little slideshow here, Crypto Finance. And so Gary Gensler created this uh, at MIT, uh, with somebody else named Joy Ito. And I'm only going to cover three different slides, I believe. Um, what was the first? The, the first one I wanted to touch on had to do with the factors, uh, the, the multi-factor Howey test, because he, he did something. I haven't, I haven't seen anybody catch this or mention that he did this, but Gary Gensler, like he's unilaterally changing the criteria of the Howey test. He's reducing the criteria. Seriously, I, I mean that very sincerely. Check this out. So here's here's the four factor Howey test. It's right on the screen right here, and then this this is accurate. U.S. Securities Law, the Howey test, 1946, uh, number one out of four. Number one, and is it an investment of money or an asset? So that's the first prong in the Howey test. If that is satisfied, along with the other three, then it passes the Howey test, meaning it is a security. So that's number one. Is it an investment of money or assets? Number two, is the investment in a common enterprise? And number three, is there a reasonable expectation of profits? Number four, is it reliant on the efforts of a promoter or others? And so uh, here's here's something that, that, you, that you need to know. In, 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 and like I said, in order for anything, any, anything to pass the Howey test, meaning it is a security, it must satisfy all four of those prongs of the Howey test, all four of them. Now check this out, though. Um, Gary Gensler, when he was speaking on August 3rd at uh, the Aspen Security Forum, uh, he, he was uh, speaking about the Howey test, and he said it's a three-factor uh, three factor test. Not four. He said it's a three-factor test. Do you know what he removed? He removed the one having to do with a common enterprise. He just unilaterally threw that out. He said that uh, in order for something to be a security, there must be an investment of money, with the expectation of profit on the efforts of others. So, uh, and, and again, to be clear here, I'm not just saying that he only happened to have named three things. I'm saying that before naming the three things, he said, this is a three-part test. That is what he said on August, uh, again, August 3rd of this year. It's a three-part test. He threw out the common enterprise part. Now, um, I don't have a legal background, but I will tell you my initial impress impression when I started learning about this stuff some time ago is that two of these prongs seem somewhat similar, so I, I will cede that point, but 
I, I, like they're not the same according to every attorney I've ever heard speak about this on the entire planet. And so the two that are somewhat similar is is this uh, is the investment in a common enterprise, and then this one down here, uh, the, the the last prong, is it reliant on the efforts of a promoter or others? And so. Uh, you might call the common enterprise a promoter of others, but there are di different legal ramifications as a result of this language in here. You're talking about an actual entity, and then in the fourth one, you're talking about efforts of a promoter or others, and so you're just taking that out. Like you're, you're taking out the common enterprise part unilaterally, despite this, be this being the, you know, the rule of law since 1946. Uh, you, Gary has decided it's no longer a four-factor test, it's a three-part test. I haven't seen anybody else talk about this. I swear to you, I, I just I caught it and I was just like, huh, wasn't well, that curious? Thanks, Gary. It's, that's not a mistake. He means what he said. It's it's now just a three factor test. It's not about a common enterprise, which means it's easier to satisfy the test without that criteria. But, but so, but then you got to ask too. Okay, so so there are, if there are efforts or pro, you know, promoters, uh, you know, of, of of a cryptocurrency, then so that makes it a security. Well, think about this. That that, that would mean that every every cryptocurrency on the planet is a security. Well, think about because because even if you have a, a cryptocurrency that's decentralized, so like the mo imagine whatever the most decentralized cryptocurrency on the planet ever could be in your mind. Imagine that's it. Uh, but there are still people building on top of the blockchain, so their efforts. And then if you see, even if it's like a hundred different entities building on top of a blockchain, maybe people do buy into that, counting on the efforts of those one hundred completely different entities uh, to to build, and, and uh, which increases value. And then if there's value, people are going to keep trading a cryptocurrency in perpetuity, which could raise the price of it. So just the fact that people are building on top of a layer of technology, now it's a security? Is this the world we want to live in? This doesn't make any damn sense to Moon Lambo. No, thank you, sir, our madam. Absolutely not. And so go down here. Uh, here's, what he, here's what they had to say about Ether. Uh, ETH, and he, oh, I love this. You, you guys, you, oof, please sit tight for the rest of this video. You're gonna, there's some rich stuff in here. Uh, ETH sold for Bitcoin in 2014, one year prior to Ethereum blockchain release. Uh, Ether ICO, so these Garrigans are saying that there was an Ethereum ICO. Again, this is the current SEC chair. Back then he was not. He was teaching at, at uh, SEC, or SEC, at, the, at MIT. And, and, um, and he shared this with a class. He said that there was an Ethereum ICO funded. Uh, it funded a common enterprise, Ethereum Foundation's development, legal and other costs. Because mind you, back in 2018, Gary Ginzer believed in the four part Howey test. Uh, today, he believes in a three part Howey test. So that's easier to sue everybody into oblivion. But back then, he did believe that the, the common enterprise part actually mattered. And so he said that there's an ICO. So why the hell isn't uh, the SEC going after Ethereum? Then? Not that I want them to, but I'm asking, where, where's the equal distribution of justice? Non-existent. Next bullet point. Purchasers had a reasonable expectation of profit based on appreciation of ETH solely from the efforts of the promoter, the Ethereum Foundation, and others such as consensus. And so that part is certainly true specifically with the Ethereum Foundation. Uh, the Ether fits the Howey test perfectly. Uh, next bullet point. In 42-day offering period, predefined sales prices represented a 50% increase in the retail price of ETH. Uh, the Ether next bullet point. The Ethereum Foundation also played a central role in the hard fork related to the attack of uh, the DAO smart contract in 2016. And last bullet point. One might say, however, regardless of whether the ETH sale in 2014 passed the Howey test, Circumstances today are sufficiently different with broad use of ETH on the decentralized Ethereum network. And so here's the deal. They don't have a specific date that this slideshow was created, but it is June 2018. And on June 14th, 2018, that's when Henman gave a speech. So I, I, I'm wondering if perhaps this was after because they're, they're basically referencing, OK, well, it is sufficiently decentralized now, even though just a, a couple months prior to this, uh, Gary Ginsburg publicly stated that he thinks uh, he, he thought at the time, April 2018, that Ethereum uh, absolutely was a security. It was, it, it did represent an investment contract. And so here they're saying, well, maybe today it doesn't. Two months later. So I, it, it is what it is, man. Um, but it's just, it, it's just maddening seeing all of this here. You know, and what do you mean regardless of whether ETH sale in 2014 passed? Well, th isn't that relevant? <clears throat> I mean... Given the fact that there was an ICO and Gary Gensler admits that here, it's on your screen, Gary Gensler admits there was an ETH ICO, where's the legal action against that? 
And then he gets into XRP. Take a look at this. XRP was launched in 2013 with Ripple Labs initially holding 80% of the total tokens. And by the way, to be clear, uh, R Ripple's holdings, that's not a consideration in the Howey test. Go through the four prongs. Ripple's holding of the asset is not a consideration in the Howey test. Next bullet point. Ripple has subsequently sold or used XRP in operations, now owning 60% of the tokens. Uh, number three. Uh, purchasers invested money or gave valuable services to a common enterprise, Ripple. And so let me pause there. Like, even if you could reasonably argue that back in 2013, Ripple was perceived as a common enterprise, you sure as hell can't. You sure as hell can't argue that today. Which is why, even if there were past infractions, like, uh, and I'm not ceding that point to you, but I'm just saying, if there were, okay, that's one thing. But to state that today. Uh, you know, Ripple's a common enterprise. Oh, gosh, no. That's just completely absurd. Nobody with half a brain thinks that. Uh, and so then and the next bullet point, purchasers had a reasonable expectation of profit based upon the efforts of the promoter, Ripple. Uh, I've already talked about that. I don't need to harp on that more. Next bullet point, uh, Ripple CEO has said, quote, to build XRP liquidity, we have been mindful over the years about how we distribute XRP. We engage in distribution strategies that we expect will result in a strengthening XRP exchange rate against other currencies. And so a, a number of things on this. In an environment where there's sufficient decentralization and a number of developers building on top of a blockchain, uh, good actors in the space, all of them, uh, should should want to do to, to engage in activities that would ensure sufficient liquidity if that's something that's in their wheelhouse and and then as far as the exchange rate against other currencies everybody should care about that if you're part of the ecosystem don't you think so like, does that in and of itself mean that uh, that there's a, some sort of securities violation here uh, I, I would certainly argue no I just go back to the the four prong Howie test not the three prong you go to the four prong Howie test and uh, if that's, uh, I mean, and look, and I'll change my tune. If, 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 if there are attorneys within the XRP community, if I bring this up, because I plan to bring this up to them, if they say, no, it's sufficiently the same, like two, two of those prongs where it's okay to say three and not four, I'll take all this back. And that's fine because I don't have a legal background. I'm happy to admit if that's the case. But right now that sure as hell doesn't look like that. And so if you're talking about the four prongs of the Howie test, uh, what matters is are all four of them satisfied because it has to be the case that all of them are satisfied or else it doesn't pass the test, meaning it's not a security. And so there, there isn't a common enterprise here. And I still think in a healthy ecosystem that's sufficiently decentralized where there isn't a common enterprise, every good actor should want uh, should want there to, to be an exchange rate that's positive against other currencies and, and should act in a way that would, you know, more likely than not support that, that end goal. Because everybody in the community you think would have that end goal, right? I think that's perfectly reasonable. Then they cite here, Ripple's website maintains a link to buy XRP on 16 different exchanges. And they write, Ripple's, uh, Ripple leads development of the platform and partners with firms to use the network. Uh, then the next bullet point, Ripple possibly influences significant control over which nodes can validate transactions and releases new white papers for the network. So I got to pause right there and say that is factually incorrect. That is provably a factually incorrect statement. He was teaching this at MIT. Uh, it's just the recklessness of this. And I understand, so, uh, like, the XRP ledger is even more decentralized now than it was in 2018. But even back then, Ripple had no special permissions over the XRP ledger. That was provably true then. This is sloppy. So I don't know if it's just that, uh, I mean, so, well, it's one or two things. Either he was just, like, uh, sloppy and, uh, and didn't report properly just out of ignorance, or there was intent. And so perhaps it's the case that it's just sloppy work here. But uh, e either way... Uh, it's 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 certainly not the case that Ripple had any control any sp it, more than any other actor within the the space within the XR, XRP ledger here, and then the last one. Now this is the part where you think Gary must be severely regretting this. Take a look at this. This is not going to help the SEC versus Ripple case. One might say, however, that XRP has been usable in some fashion on the Ripple network since 2013, and that XRP and the Ripple network might still exist even if Ripple, the company, disappeared. <gasps> well, how about that? So isn't that sufficient decentralization then if Ripple... I don't know why they said might. It definitely would. Like the XRP ledger wouldn't just go away. People use it. They functionally use it. Uh, so, uh, like Even speculators use it. Uh, there's there's Coil. There's all sorts of entities today. And, and there were back then too. There's even more so today though. 
But what do you mean, might still? No, it definitely would. Which means that if that's the case, if it can still exist, how is it? How could it possibly be the case that there's a common enterprise, which is one of the four prongs of the Howey test, and it's the one prong that Gary Gensler is pretending now doesn't exist? What in the ever-loving hell is that? And so I'm glad that we have this these PowerPoint-looking slides here because Gary Gensler has admitted that uh, XRP, it's sufficiently... I mean, that's what the, this is an admission of that, I say that uh, XRP would continue to exist even if Ripple, the company, went away, which means there can't be a common enterprise. I mean, do you think that Apple stock would exist if Apple stopped existing? No. <laughs> of course not. Bunch of nonsense. I'll go ahead and wrap it up there. Though. I'm not a financial advisor. You should not buy or sell anything because of anything I say or write. That would be a very, very, very bad idea. Until next time, to the moon, Lambo.